you, Jovan. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I forgot my exact title, but I think uh, it had a, a, a thresholding scheme uh, for mean curvature flow in the title. But uh, in principle, what, what I think is, is the interesting uh, message of it that uh, in, in the talk, I want to connect three things which perhaps at first sight are not, uh, not really connected. So uh, I want to make a link. So I, let me be a bit more uh, structured. So my first chapter will be on, uh, will be just the introduction. Can you read from the back? So introduction and, uh, uh, and preliminaries. And, uh, um, and as I started to say, uh, the, uh, the talk should link uh, three uh, perhaps a priori not so related things, ne on the, namely on the first side, um, the uh, uh, Bracke uh, inequality characterization of mean curvature flow. So I think you must have had this abbreviation already after a week, right? Uh, in curvature flow. And, uh, and uh, if I'm well informed, uh, Joshi Tonegawa uh, spoke about uh, uh, constructing uh, solutions for network flow in the sense of Bracke. Is that correct? Did he do, did he do that? Yeah. And uh, so that's, uh, let me just, uh, so if I'm correct, that's, uh, that's something which uh, is uh, already uh, around for a while. And then uh, um, a connection to uh, 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 one of the uh, many ideas of uh, De Giorgi, namely uh, his uh, minimizing movements. which uh, must have, so here I'm not so sure because uh, essentially what I know about this is based on the book of uh, Ambrosio uh, Gili Savare, uh, which of course is much more recent, but uh, I think these ideas might have been around in the early 90s, but uh, the experts may correct me. And then, um, and then a numerical scheme uh, for uh, mean curvature flow, which I will eventually introduce and which uh, uh, is extremely successful and uh, very popular, and which goes by the name of uh, thresholding a scheme, and which was introduced by uh, uh, now uh, that's not alphabetical order uh, by uh, Merriman, uh, Benz, and that's perhaps the most important or best known name, Stanley Osher, uh, in '92. And uh, so, uh, so in a certain sense, that's, uh, uh, that's the plan of the talk, to make a link th between these three, uh, these three subjects. And, um, <clears throat> and since I guess you already have heard quite a bit about Bracke, uh, I will not start with this. And uh, I, in that, instead, today, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about this uh, set of ideas uh, in its uh, kind of most basic uh, and fairly abstract form which in a certain sense is about gradient flows on metric spaces or in metric framework. And I want to introduce, uh, depending on how much time I have, uh, this thresholding scheme and uh, make the link between, uh, between these two. So, uh, um, so let's start with, uh, uh, with minimizing movements. So uh, this is, uh, let me start at first with a completely formal or informal, so non-rigorous or heuristic uh, discussion on, uh, on gradient flows. So gradient flows are kind of uh, a, a, dy a dynamical system. If you're given an energy uh, a functional on your configuration space, and I'm going to use the letter chi to denote configurations because I'm already thinking of characteristic functions of sets the boundary of which evolved by mean curvature. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you're given such a, fu such a functional, and, uh, uh, but then you also have a, a Euclidean structure which allows you to make sense of uh, the gradient or a Riemannian structure 
uh, perhaps I will get to that, uh, but uh, it's not important uh, for the moment. And so that defines a vector field, uh, the gradient field, and the gradient flow then is uh, uh, kind of uh, the dynamical system, which is given by, you know, even if it's infinite dimensional, let's write it as an ODE, by uh, uh, flowing uh, in the direction of the negative gradient. And uh, I guess as all of you are familiar, uh, it has kind of one uh, uh, built-in property, namely that the, um, uh, uh, that the energy functional is a Lyapunov uh, functional along these trajectories because you easily compute that uh, this is uh, negative and it can either, either be given uh, it can either, either be written as the, uh, 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 as the squared uh, norm of the gradient or uh, uh, the squared norm of the slope. And uh, in fact, there is, uh, um, but, but kind of the fact that this uh, energy functional is Lyapunov functional, in fact, does not, of course, characterize a gradient flow. But there is something very similar, and that's probably one of the observations already of De Georgi that you can characterize a gradient flow at least formally by an inequality. So uh, uh, it's characterized by uh, the following inequality, namely uh, E of chi at some time t plus one half times the integral from zero to t of uh, this expression plus one half times the integral from zero to t of that expression is less than the energy of the initial data. So uh, I can give you the argument in a second. Uh, uh, George's observation was that this, uh, this inequality uh, at least formally is a perfect, uh, perfect, perfectly equivalent way of encoding, uh, encoding what a gradient flow is. And it's, uh, I think he liked it and uh, because it gives you the impression uh, that you could kind of create an existence theory based on this inequality, kind of a softer existence theory based on this inequality because the terms which are on the left-hand side kind of look like being lower semi-continuous. Energies typically are lower semi-continuous. These expressions, in particular kind of an energy of a curve, looks like something lower semi-continuous. So uh, in the limit, uh, this inequality, if, you, if let's say you have well-prepared initial data, kind of this converges. In the limit, uh, there's a chance that uh, uh, this inequality is preserved by, by easy means. So, but uh, let's just... Uh, Let's just do the little calculation why this indeed is a reformulation of a gradient flow by rewriting the left-hand side as uh, uh, the energy plus uh, one-half times the integral from zero to t of d chi dt plus the gradient of e of chi squared dt plus, uh, or I guess minus, uh, uh, grad E chi in a product with D chi dt, zero t, uh, where I sh shouldn't call this, then I should call this S, like over there, and this little t ds. So that's just playing with, uh, with linear algebra, kind of completing the square. And, uh, uh, and if you do that, you realize that this here is a, a total derivative. That's kind of the same calculation which goes into this identity here. Uh, and therefore, this integral here uh, is equal with the minus sign minus e of chi of t plus e of chi of zero, so that this, uh, uh, that this term, oops, that this term cancels, and uh, and now you see now you see that if this in so we have rewritten the left hand side. If this inequality is true, then uh, also this term cancels with uh, with the right hand side, 
and we get that this integral must be equal to zero, but this can only be true since the integrand is non-negative if the integrand vanishes, which just means that uh, you're indeed looking at a gradient flow trajectory. So, uh, uh, so that's the argument, uh, the formal argument on the level, let's say, of a finite dimensional Euclidean gradient flow, which shows you that this is indeed kind of uh, an honest reformulation of a gradient flow. And that should remind you, and that's ultimately the connection we want to make, uh, that there uh, also Bracke characterizes mean curvature flow by an inequality or a family of inequalities. And in, in the end, we want to draw a connection between, uh, between these, two, uh, uh, these two approaches. Okay, so, uh, but, uh, so that's, uh, of course, the Georgie didn't stop there, but um, uh, he uh, also uh, probably actually inspired by other works in mean curvature flow by Armgren, Taylor, and Wang, which I will uh, explain a little bit later. Um, he, uh, he looked at kind of uh, natural time discretizations of gradient flows. And uh, as, again, probably many of you are familiar with, uh, uh, once you have a gradient flow, uh, it allows for a natural time discretization. So you have a time step size h, and, uh, uh, and so therefore you have, uh, you have the time steps, uh, you have the zero step, you have the first step, the second step, and so on at time zero, at time h, at time 2h, and so on. And the configuration, let's call it chi zero, uh, chi one, chi two, and so on. And the, uh, uh, the, natural disc uh, the natural discretization comes in form of a variational problem which reads as follows, um, uh, where chi n is a, or the minimizer, or let me write it like this, minimizes uh, the energy plus uh, the squared distance to uh, the previous time step with a huge factor in front, namely one over two times this time step size. So, uh, uh, and here I should, uh, let me first put, because I was thinking about the Euclidean case, let me first uh, use Euclidean note notation here and then I move to the metric setting. So, uh, um, uh, so why is this the case? Uh, again, uh, if you, uh, if you write down the Euler-Lagrange equation for this variation problem, you realize that the Euler-Lagrange equation is given by the gradient of the energy functional at your uh, optimizer plus the gradient of this expression, which because of the square, the one half goes away, one over h chi n minus chi n minus one is equal to zero. And if you look at this, you realize that this is nothing else than the implicit Euler scheme for uh, for this uh, for this OD. So therefore, um, therefore, uh, this. Uh, um, this is indeed kind of uh, 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 kind of variational discretization of uh, of gradient flow, and now De Georgi said, "Well, this is something we, which we can write down in the absence of any differentiable structure, because all we need is an energy functional and a notion of distance." So he kind of generalized this and said, "Let's look at uh, gradient flows in metric spaces." So discrete gradient flows, or what he called minimizing movements. So you have a metric space with a distance function. And uh, he just uh, replaced the, uh, the Euclidean distance by the metric. So he said, uh, well, let's look at uh, 
kind of the disc time discrete evolution, which is given by the possibly non uniqueness, by the possibly non unique uh, minimizer of. Uh, Uh, the same type of problem, d square chi, chi n minus one. I'm using the physicist's notation. I hate putting the square over here. Uh, I put it always there because then it's clear what's meant. Um, but my spelling is off. Okay, so, um, uh, so, uh, so what's one, uh, I mean, there's one immediate um, uh, feature of this time discretization, namely that you get uh, an a priori estimate for free. And you get it by just taking the previous time step as a competitor. And if you do that, uh, you get that uh, E of chi n plus uh, 1 over 2 h d square chi n, chi n minus 1 is less than E of chi n minus 1. And now this is something we, you can sum up and use kind of a telescoping property here of the left and the right hand side. And you get the, uh, the estimate that uh, for any uh, step E, uh, N, capital N, E of chi, capital N, plus uh, the sum little n uh, from one to capital N, one over two H, D square chi N, chi N minus one, is less than the initial energy. Now that's very nice because it immediately gives you, for instance, if you want an L infinity bound in time on the energy, because uh, it immediately tells you, because that's a non-negative term, it tells you that the uh, energy, you know, always goes downhill. So uh, all the later energies are estimated by the initial energy. But in fact, also this term here is nice because if you think uh, again about the Euclidean case, Uh, then you realize that uh, uh, if the discretization converges, uh, this term should behave like uh, h squared <coughs> uh, times uh, the time integral square, so that this sum here, in fact, uh, uh, is better interpreted as a Riemann sum, where it behaves like the integral from zero to n times h, so some later time horizon of d chi dt square ds. So in a certain sense, morally speaking, uh, on the discrete level, uh, this energy, uh, this a priori estimate encodes this a priori estimate encodes that uh, the supremum overall t e of chi T, or let me write it like this, e of chi t plus, ah, very important, I've got the factor one half here, uh, plus uh, one half zero t d chi dt square ds is less or equal than the initial energy. Okay? So, uh, so in principle, uh, I mean, not only is this a priori estimate easy to get, in the end, it almost looks perfect. But, uh, um, but if you look at, more, look at it more cl closely, and I almost forgot the most important thing, you realize that it misses what you would expect here by a factor of one half. So it misses the uh, correct uh, energy dissipation relation this factor one half. Or to put it differently, 
if you think in terms of this characterization of uh, the Georgi of gradient flows, it captures this term, but it misses that term. So therefore, um, you have to work more if you, uh, if you want to hope to, uh, uh, to recover, at least in this, uh, if you want weak form, to recover uh, uh, the gradient flow structure from this variation principle in the limit when you let the time step size go to zero. And, uh, and there, DeGiorgi came up with kind of the right notions on a completely abstract level. And that's the first lemma which I want to formulate. And as I said, I know it from uh, uh, the book by uh, uh, Luigi Ambrosio, um, Nicola Gili, who's here in CISA, and uh, Giuseppe Savary. I think the first edition was in 04. And, uh, and the statement, uh, let me have a look, uh, which, needs, which means I need my glasses. Um, the um, statement uh, is about like this. Uh, so let xd be, here I'm making my life a little bit simpler by assuming, and for our application that's perfectly fine, let this be a compact uh, metric space. And uh, E be uh, a continuous function on X. And uh, we're given some initial, um, uh, some initial condition of at least one time step. Chi, uh, so chi is some configuration in X. Uh, then uh, there is uh, what the Georgi called the um, uh, variational interpolation so what does he mean by this um, he means by this uh, uh, that one should interpolate between two subsequent time steps not by a piecewise linear interpolation which or a piecewise constant piecewise linear wouldn't make a sense in a general statement but one should use the same variational principle to interpolate. So uh, here my previous time step is chi. And uh, so what he looks at, by the way, can you see if I write here? Also the people in the back, those who don't look, probably don't care. Um, so uh, for uh, any time t, uh, consider uh, a minimizer u of t, I will call it u of t instead of chi of t uh, in other, eventually you will see that this is convenient to, uh, to uh, have a different notation there um, because in our application u will not be a characteristic function in general. So for any uh, positive time consider a minimizer uh, u of t in x uh, of uh, a functional in the same spirit, uh, so E of u plus 1 over 2t d of u chi squared. That minimizer exists because we made the right assumptions, compactness and continuity, but of course there's no reason for it to be unique. Now comes the, the important statement. Then he points out that uh, uh, this here, in fact, is, uh, is throwing away too much. 
and you can recover something which, uh, as we will see, will turn into uh, the missing part. So, oops. So then uh, uh, one has that E of U uh, T plus one half D square, one, half, one over two T D square U of T chi is less or equal to E of chi. So that would be no gain with respect to this cheap estimate just with a slightly different notation. But then comes the important, uh, important thing. There is a second term, which looks almost the same, but in a certain sense is a slight average. Zero to t, one over two s squared, d u s chi d s squared. Now, the second term, in a certain sense, has the same strength as the, uh, as the first term. Uh, this additional 1 over s in the numerator is compensated by the, uh, by the small time interval. And um, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of a missing term like an improvement of the estimate, which you get thanks to uh, introducing this uh, variational interpolation. But now this doesn't yet look uh, like what you want. So you want the green term to look like this. And that's the second notion which he introduced, uh, which is the notion of the metric slope. And uh, what it states is that uh, uh, for any positive t, um, so, or, uh, so what's the metric slope? Uh, uh, consider, uh, so that's kind of the attempt to define a gradient of a functional in a completely metric, non-Riemannian, non-Euclidean setting. And it only works insofar as you can define uh, the length of the gradient, and but that one you define very much as you would do as the uh, limb soup of v going to uh, u in the sense that uh, the distance goes to zero of e of u uh, e of v no e of I want to let, take the positive part, and I'm mostly interested in, in it becoming. Uh, downhill in the downhill part of the slope, so it's e of u minus e of v, the positive part divided by d u v. And that, of course, a priori is uh, a number which could take the value of plus infinity. And uh, then the statement is that you can upgrade this in the uh, following way. plus, let me use this green color, 0 to t, 1 over 2 s, d square, uh, sorry. Um, uh, and there is uh, 1 over 1 half um, d e uh, u of t squared ds is less than uh, e of chi. And this is u of s. And now you should compare, uh, unfortunately I, I, switched, uh, I switched the order, you should compare um, this line and this line, and uh, see that essentially you have the same structure. So uh, 
uh, you, with help of this, uh, uh, with help of this uh, 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 variational interpolation, you manage to uh, uncover this, I mean, instead of using this, uh, in a certain sense, loser estimate here, which serves well in getting an a priori estimate, but which doesn't serve, which doesn't capture the right dissipation structure of the equation, you have uncovered uh, uh, kind of this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this additional term, and now there's a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between, uh, between all the terms on the left-hand side and, of course, also on the right-hand side. So now the hope is that if you use this variational interpolation, you use it for every time step you sum up, you get something which very much looks like this, and then you could hope to use general lower semi-continuity properties to pass to the limit and get a, a fairly soft uh, convergence result. That's the, uh, I think that's the inherent idea of, uh, of this approach. And so not using uh, as it has been fashionable in, in the last 15 years, using convexity, because most problems, most gradient flows are not convex. The interesting ones are not convex, because uh, the interesting evolutions are non-unique, and therefore they couldn't be convex or lambda convex. So it's good to have tools that allow for dealing with gradient flow in kind of badly non-convex situations. And, uh, um, and this, uh, this idea of the Georgie in principle, provides such an idea, uh, such such a way of uh, of dealing with uh, with gradient flows in non-convex non situations. Other questions? So this is uh, this is now completely abstract metric theory. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, so I didn't. Um, um, I didn't mention one one point, namely that uh, uh, um, this, it, as it will come out of the proof, this uh, quantity here is an increasing function in S. So, in particular, it's measurable. And now, uh, uh, and then there is uh, there is a clean inequality from here to here. So if you interpret this integral in the right sense, since you're integrating something non-negative, there's also no problem with, uh, with doing this. So how do you go from minimization to Yeah, I wanted to give the proof. Ah, okay, okay. It's, an, it's, it's a very easy, it's a fairly elementary proof, and I wanted to give the proof, because it's a nice, uh, it's a nice proof. But uh, first wanted to uh, ask the question whether the statement is clear. Okay, then uh, then let me give uh, let me give the proof. Uh, yes, I'm going to erase. Yeah. Uh, Kai. Kai is a point in this metric space. So this is completely abstract. In the application, Kai will be a characteristic function describing a set and u will be a function which has values in the unit interval. But at this stage, for this part of uh, the Georgi's theory, uh, all you need is a, is a metric space. So in that sense, it's a general point in this metric space. Like, uh, very much like here, I mean, I didn't tell you what, uh, what these objects are. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a completely general theory. More questions? Okay, so then let me. Uh, give you the proof of this lemma one. So there's a first step uh, uh, for the first part. And uh, uh, this one re essentially relies on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, two uh, nested inequalities. So we claim that for all times S 
and t ordered in this way, uh, e, ah, uh, introduce, so introduce one abbreviation, uh, little e of t is the, uh, uh, the minimum value here. which uh, is assumed at u of t. That's the definition. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, the only inequality which you need is that e of uh, s minus e of t divided by t minus s is less than one over two st d square uh, u of t chi from above and below almost the same expression d square u of s chi. So I give you the argument, it's a kind of five line argument, but let's first see why, uh, why we're done. Why are we done? Then we're done with the first part. Then so why, uh, what, uh, what do we read off this, uh, uh, this type of inequality? So first, uh, uh, what we read off is if we forget the middle part, we read off uh, what I said here, namely that this uh, distance to the base point is increasing in t. So. That's not surprising. I mean, that conf confirms our intuition that as we make t larger, we relax this penalizing term, which wants u to be close to chi. So therefore, kind of uh, the energy gets more room, but you're moving away from chi. So that's obvious. So in particular, uh, an, uh, an increasing, uh, a non-decreasing, I should say, Uh, a non-decreasing function by elementary calculus can only have a countable number of jumps. Um, but even if you, I mean, let's postpone that for a second. The, uh, the, second, uh, uh, the second observation you can see here is that this function little e of e is locally Lipschitz. Because this uh, uh, difference, uh, I mean, this difference quotient stays locally bounded. And now I come back to what I said before. Decreasing functions are differentiable besides a countable set. Where this function is differentiable, sorry, are continuous besides a countable set. Where this function is continuous, uh, the function E is differentiable. Uh, so we have that uh, uh, minus, uh, or let me write it like this, DE DT S plus uh, one over two S square uh, D square e of s chi is equal to zero uh, for all but countably many s. And now uh, we integrate this uh, identity from let's say a small positive num number tau to t over s. Uh, which yields uh, little e of t plus uh, the integral from tau to t of 1 over 2 s squared d squared u of s chi ds uh, is equal to e of tau. But trivially, comparing, uh, comparing uh, 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 taking chi itself as a competitor, you realize that e of tau is less than capital E of chi. So, and, and this here by definition is what it should be, uh, e of u of t plus one over two t uh, d 
u of t chi squared. So therefore, letting tau go to zero and using uh, uh, monotone convergence or Bepolevi, as we say in German, um, you realize that this, uh, this integral here converges to that one. And so, uh, so we're done. We got, the, uh, we got this, uh, this first inequality, provided we convince ourselves of this, uh, this identity. And that, that uh, as I said, is, uh, uh, is very easy. So why is this true? Uh, so for, uh, for any st positive, but not necessarily already ordered in this way, we get that e of t, uh, the definition of which uh, is, uh, is here, uh, is uh, clearly less than if I uh, take uh, u of s as a competitor plus 1 over 2s d square u of s chi. And uh, now, sorry, here, but here we have t. Now if I want to write, if I want to, uh, 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 if I had an s instead of a t here, uh, this would be e of s, but I have a t, so I make a, a little error, which uh, is this one, and that's, of course, s minus t over 2st. And uh, so uh, uh, now I can exchange the roles of s and t. And you get e of s is less than e of t uh, plus, uh, or rather minus, uh, or yeah, plus uh, t minus s to st d square u of t chi. Now we have these two inequalities. Uh, you divide by t minus s, and you're done. So by t minus s, uh, in the case where t minus s is positive, uh, which we have here. So uh, so that's uh, that's the proof of the uh, that's the proof of the main part. So how, how how one can recover this term, and now for the metric slope, that's essentially the triangle inequality. So let's look at the second part. Um, so uh, if we look at uh, u of t minus e of v, uh, we have by uh, definition uh, that this is equal to uh, e of little t minus 1 over 2t d square u of t chi for the first term, and for the second term, uh, this, uh, this, this expression is minimized by that. With the minus sign, that gives the right, side, uh, right term. U of t minus 1 over 2t d square uh, v of chi. So this drops out. And we get uh, 1 over 2t d square v of chi minus d square u of chi. Uh, let's rewrite this uh, as uh, 1 over t, 2 times uh, d uh, v of chi plus d u of t chi uh, times d of v chi minus d u of t chi. Now, there's not much you have at hand, so uh, here you use the triangle inequality, uh, u of t v, and here you use it again in the form of this. And uh, if you do that, you see that uh, 
you get this term twice, which uh, behaves well with the one half. Uh, so you get one over T D V chi plus one half D U of T chi uh, times D U of T V. And uh, now you divide by this term. So your 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 question is about this part. Ah, yeah, V. Sorry, thank you. Here it's also V. Thanks. So you get uh, E of uh, U of T minus E of V divided by D U of T V is estimated by. 1 over t uh, d uh, v uh, actually do I want this I want rather the uh, I want something uh, I want um, I didn't do that I should have worked on this term and said that this term is less than this one plus the difference Sorry. So this is less than uh, d of u of t chi plus d of u of t v. And uh, t. I have this term twice. And uh, so here I have u of t chi times uh, a plus one half d of u of t v. And now if you take the limit uh, uh, or the limb soup, v going to uh, u of t in the sense that the uh, metric goes to zero, uh, then this term drops out. And uh, what you get is the inequality uh, by definition of the metric slope, that the metric slope at uh, your variational interpolation is estimated by 1 over t times d uh, u of t chi. And, uh, and that's, the, uh, that's the remaining thing which needs to be pasted in here to go from here to here. So that's, uh, that's the inequality which leads from there to there. Okay, so uh, so that's the proof. There's not uh, there's, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really something you one could do in uh, in, uh, in 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 calculus first year. I mean, at in Europe, um, first year, um, first year. Uh, I mean, I only I only I, I wouldn't do it in the U.S. Uh, but uh, but I would do it in Germany. And probably also in Italy. Uh, so, uh, uh, because it, 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 I mean, you j essentially we just use the triangle inequality and a little bit uh, on monotone functions, right? And uh, uh, and it gives you this uh, gives you this uh, this thing. So, so in principle, uh, I think, I mean, probably uh, uh, now one should be very hopeful. I mean, in a certain sense, perhaps people were at first too optimistic that this should be used in many, could be used in many instances. By the way, it has also been uh, kind of, uh, it it's also falls a little bit in, I mean, the philosophy which then, for instance, has been taken up by, uh, by Etienne Sandier and uh, Silvia Serfati, kind of passing to the limits and gradient flows. Uh, but, um, but in the end, I don't think that there is so much, uh, it has not been used as much as uh, one, one could hope or one perhaps hoped at the, uh, at the beginning. Okay, so that's to Georgie. Uh, how much, so uh, what's the time? I mean, when, up to, up to, 
Okay, so let me, um, let me start with the second, uh, at least a little bit with the second one and tell, me, tell you about this, uh, about this uh, uh, numerical algorithm. And how it fits into this, uh, into this metric framework. So, uh, so what's this, uh, this thresholding algorithm for mean curvature flow, which uh, so now, now, uh, now things have a meaning. So chi n is a characteristic function, and it's the characteristic function of a set the boundary of which uh, evolves by mean curvature flow. At time, uh, n times h, and h is the time step size as before. And, uh, and the scheme consists of two parts. So it's a time, it's not a spatial discretization. There's an easy spatial discretization of it. But it's at a priori, it's just a time discretization, and it goes like this. There is, it comes in two steps. There is a convolution step where you say, let's introduce a function un, which is the convolution of the characteristic function of the set at the previous time step with uh, the heat kernel at time h. which is nothing else than the centered Gaussian with variance h, which uh, is, uh, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, can be obtained from the standard Gaussian just by uh, rescaling with square root of h and uh, G1 is just the standard Gaussian, which essentially is this function here with uh, uh, 2 pi square root of d. And uh, so it's the heat kernel with the, uh, uh, in the kind of with a factor of 1 half, which probabilists use. And um, uh, so that's the convolution step. So you're smearing out your characteristic function. And then comes the thresholding step. where you say, well, uh, your new characteristic function should be just the set where um, the uh, smeared out characteristic function is above average. So larger than 1 half, so equals, so that's equal to 1 uh, uh, on this set and equal to 0 else. And what you do when it's equal to 1 half, uh, which is a thin set, you don't, uh, you don't worry. So, uh, so that's the thresholding scheme. It's very easy to write down. Uh, modulo uh, spatial discretization by kind of finite differences, it's very easy to uh, code because convolution can be carried out efficiently by fast Fourier transform. And this uh, thresholding, of course, is just a very local step. So it's very, uh, it's very powerful. And, uh, and uh, in particular, it can be used in kind of the multi-phase case, so in the network case, which was actually uh, our um, interest in the, uh, in the beginning. So in principle, I will, I mean, in, the, in, in this course, I guess I will focus always on the case of a single phase, so, or two phases, which is a little bit of matter how you call, but uh, all of what I'm presenting um, uh, uh, is also valid in the multi-phase case of so the networks, if you want, uh, but, um, I mean the high, high dimensional analog of, of networks. And the, the generalization is obvious. Then you have kind of a partition and you ask yourself which of the functions after convolution is the largest one and that one wins. That's where kind of the set invades into. And uh, uh, um, so, uh, um, right, okay. Uh, 
so that's the, uh, uh, and you can also see it, uh, and people have done that as a time splitting of the Alan Kahn approximation. I don't know whether Takis Suganidis already or talked about this, where, uh, uh, you know, you think of the Alan Kahn equation as, um, um, as uh, uh, um, in, uh, uh, in this way, oops, where uh, now you do time splitting on this where you first do a kind of a diffusion step, which uh, is essentially this, and then you do a, a step where you uh, uh, solve this ODE, but you solve it till the bitter end uh, until kind of the values of u are again zero and one, which is a little bit like a thresholding step. So uh, it has reminiscences with, uh, uh, with this phase field approximation of mean curvature flow, and of course something which you immediately see is that uh, it preserves uh, um, the ordering as mean curvature flow because if uh, uh, you have two characteristic functions which uh, uh, at the previous time step are ordered, this ordering is preserved by convolution with a non-negative function and of course uh, then it's also preserved by this thresholding. And so this is a good scheme because it preserves one of the basic features of, uh, of the single phase mean curvature flow. And in fact, uh, not surprisingly, uh, very shortly after it has been introduced, uh, uh, this has been used to show that uh, it converges uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, viscosity, to uh, mean curvature flow uh, in, uh, in the viscosity sense with possible fattening, of course. And this was immediately after the uh, scheme was introduced. Uh, Craig Evans proved that, and Guy Bao, and uh, um, I should learn this name. Georges Lain, and, uh, which was published a bit later. But, and then, uh, then for instance, uh, 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 um, Takis and now there's a third one, for instance, looked at the anisotropic case. So it's clear that uh, uh, this scheme uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, interested people coming from, uh, coming from the theory of viscosity solutions because it fits so nicely in the, uh, the two-phase case. But in fact, and that's a, that's a more uh, recent observation, it, uh, it also fits into uh, this metric uh, minimizing movement gradient flow interpretation of uh, mean curvature flow. And that's uh, um, something which uh, uh, Selim Zedoglu and I um, um, observed. couple of years ago and uh, so in the uh, uh, so again we uh, for us the main purpose was the multi-phase case with different surface tensions but here I'm just going to formulate it in this uh, in this original case because that's easier to follow so uh, uh, so in fact uh, this scheme can be interpreted as a minimizing movement scheme uh, if you're willing to uh, uh, if you're willing to uh, kind of introduce the right uh, uh, metric and the right energy functional. So uh, um, chi n minimizes uh, E h of u plus one over two h dh square u chi among all functions u. Ah, okay, I'm, I allow myself one simplification instead of working with the torus so that I don't have to think about uh, whether integrals are fine or in, instead of working with the whole space, I'm working with the torus. And since there is no length scale in the problem, I can use the unit torus. So among uh, all not necessarily characteristic functions provided uh, we define uh, the energy to be uh, the following expression. 
uh, you're uh, convolving uh, your function u. Think of it as being a characteristic function. Uh, so you're smearing out the characteristic function, and then you look how much of this smearing out enters the other face. If h is small, this will be only a small portion. So in order to have a significant quantity, you need to, uh, 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 you need to divide by the length scale of the kernel, which uh, because of this rescaling is square root of h, square root of the time step. So if you define the uh, energy like this, and the metric, and let's directly define this expression, uh, 1 over 2h u u tilde to be something very similar, namely u minus u tilde uh, gh convolved with u minus u tilde, which indeed is the square of a metric because by the semi-group property, uh, gh is the convolution of uh, gh over 2 with itself, and uh, uh, the Gauss kernel is symmetric, so uh, the convolution operator is a symmetri L2 symmetric, so I can write this as 1 over square root of h, uh, gh over 2 convolved u minus u tilde squared, which is indeed a squared norm, and indeed for fixed h, uh, this is a compact uh, um, Um, X, which is the space of all periodic functions on the unit torus with values in the unit interval, uh, which are measurable, endowed with this metric is a compact space, and E is continuous, EH is continuous, so we are in uh, we are and we will eventually use uh, the Georgi's metric uh, variational interpolation because we have no problems with topology here for fixed h. And uh, now, uh, okay, now you may say this looks a little bit contrived because we really defined, I mean, so we had to put, uh, we had to put a subscript h here because the energy functional still depends on the discretization parameter and, and the metric looks even worse uh, because uh, there's a square root of h here and there's one, two over h here. The only thing is nice, it's indeed a square of a norm. Uh, uh, but it looks a little bit contrived. But in fact, it's less contrived as you may seem, as you may think for the moment because as I already alluded to, this is the right normalization of, the, uh, of this functional. And in fact, this functional gamma converges to, uh, so it's really an Italian uh, session today, um, gamma converges to um, uh, the interfacial energy. So that's the uh, first uh, proposition, which probably, where well, the proof is more than three times three lines. So, uh, So I think uh, uh, probably also in a in kind of in a way more general situation, one of the first proofs or perhaps the first proofs was by Giovanni Alberti and uh, um, Giovanni Bellettini. Uh, two T's. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm confused with, your, with the spelling of your name, which is embarrassing, having it in front there. That, that's good if you don't pay attention. Sorry? No, no, but did I spell your name correctly? Okay. No, I, I remember the name from looking it up. Uh, that was 1898. So, uh, uh, so you proved that uh, uh, this um, in a more general context, this energy functional converges to uh, the parameter functional, uh, provided uh, chi is, the limit is a characteristic function and plus infinity else. Uh, with respect to the underlying convergence there, you have a little bit of choice, but it's enough to uh, take a, a weak convergence in L1. 
on the, uh, let's say, torus. And this constant C0, and uh, I can give you an argument for that why, uh, so it turns out to be uh, essentially coming from uh, uh, the specific convolution kernel and its one-dimensional version is, uh, is always to be uh, defined as uh, one over square root of two pi. So, uh, um, so therefore, in a certain sense, this, uh, this observation which, uh, as you will see, is a very elementary observation. I mean, it essentially is, again, completing the square. Highlights the fact that this uh, scheme, which looks like more a scheme that uh, preserves the maximum principal structure of mean curvature flow, in fact, also preserves what's known about the gradient flow structure of mean curvature flow, namely that mean curvature flow is interpreted the right way, the gradient flow of the uh, interfacial energy with respect to the right metric. And uh, um, I, I guess I will have some time to, uh, um, uh, uh, to speak about this. Uh, um, in fact, this, this idea that, uh, I mean, this insight that f at least formally uh, the mean curvature flow uh, can be interpreted as the gradient flow of uh, the interfacial energy with respect to the uh, L2 inner product on the surface, on the evolving surface, so a truly Riemannian structure, as kind of has motivated people to write down a minimizing movement scheme for mean curvature flow. But you cannot do it naively, so uh, it's a formally an infinite dimensional Riemannian structure, and Mumford and uh, Michio and Mumford have shown that the induced distance function degenerates. So you couldn't write, uh, you couldn't really follow kind of a Riemannian logic or uh, to write down a minimizing movement scheme for mean curvature flow. But of course you can try to come up with a proxy. And people have done that. That's the famous work of Angren, Taylor, and Wong who came up with a proxy for the metric and wrote down a minimizing movement scheme and then uh, there was kind of a, a conditional convergence result and then that even later on was substantially improved by, by Luckhaus and Stutzenhecker, and we'll get in that direction in a second, or I mean, not in a second, but uh, during this week, in, uh, in, in terms of this, such a convergence result. But what's surprising is that this, uh, um, that this numerical scheme, in a certain sense, has a much more, I mean, a robuster, and in the end, easier to analyze uh, minimizing movement uh, uh, interpretation. Yes? <laughs> Where are you from? Spain. Spain, okay. Uh, so gamma, gamma convergence is, um, um, is, um, is a notion of uh, convergence for variational principles. And so, uh, so let's say you have, a, you have a metric space and you have a sequence of functionals. Um, let's give them an index H. Uh, and you say that uh, this uh, sequence gamma converges to a limiting functional, uh, provided uh, you have two properties. Uh, there is what's called uh, the lim inf property. Um, and that states the following, whenever you have Um, uh, so, I mean, for, so for any chi in X, you have the following. Uh, for any sequence a, uh, chi H that converges to chi with respect to your metric here would be uh, weak convergence, um, you must have that the limiting energy uh, is below the uh, lim inf of uh, the approximate energies. So no matter how you approximate uh, your limiting configuration by, uh, 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 by sequence, you have to have this inequality. And then uh, there is kind of the construction part, which states that uh, there exists, so this is uh, for all sequences, there exists a distinguished sequence uh, for which you have the other direction.
And this has been, again, it's something which the Georgi uh, coined. Uh, again, it's something very general, and if you want soft, and it has been proven as kind of, uh, so one immediate consequence of this here is that absolute minimizers of this functional converge to absolute minimizers of this functional. Strict relative minimizers of this functional, you will find strict uh, relative minimizers, local, local minimizers here. It has, been, uh, it has been proven extremely successful in, uh, in the analysis of singularly perturbed variational problems. And in particular, the applied analysis community is uh, very fond of it. Okay, so uh, um, so there is this uh, there is this property of uh, of gamma convergence, uh, uh, which shows that uh, indeed this uh, um, this minimizing movement interpretation has something to do with uh, 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 with mean curvature flow because the energy functional converges to the right thing. So, uh, so what's the plan? So first of all, I should say uh, what I'm presenting here is uh, joint work uh, with uh, Tim Laux, who is now in Berkeley, postdoc in Berkeley, and, uh, uh, and myself. And uh, uh, we posted, so there are two papers by us, uh, two uh, conditional convergence results. Uh, one is, um, more for the experts, more in the spirit of Lukas and Stutznecker. And the second one I want to talk about uses this Bracke inequality and uses uh, the Georgie's ideas. And we posted, uh, or he posted, kind of a new version um, on the archive of the second of the second work uh, should be available by today. So look at the archive. So there's an older version which is already around for a while, and we cleaned it up a little bit. And uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's the um, that's the reference. So, what I um, what I want to do next what I want to do uh, next time is uh, well, I want to uh, I want to give the short argument uh, um, uh, for for this one. I want to give the main at least the main ingredient for uh, this type of result uh, and. Uh, and then I want to, uh, but the big thing, I mean, what I, what, I, what I want to try to do in this course, if I have the time, is to show to you how one can use this, um, uh, these tools by De Georgi, so what we have just seen in the first lemma, to uh, uh, show that uh, um, uh, this scheme converges under an additional assumption um, to, uh, to kind of this Bracke notion of mean curvature flow by exactly using kind of the Georgie's tools. So uh, that's what I said at the very beginning. I want to make the connection between uh, this uh, very performant uh, numerical scheme, uh, 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 the Georgie's ideas of uh, uh, metric gradient flows, and, um, and Bracke's uh, inequality characterization of mean curvature flow. So that's the, uh, that's the plan for uh, for the remaining times. And now I, th I think my time is over, and like the other speakers, I haven't left time for questions.